live for around an hour, during which you can submit questions um, through the Q&A functionality within the webinar. You can also tweet us questions at GetDuro. Um, the webinar will be recorded and afterwards we'll send out a link and the recording will be available on our YouTube channel. Um, today I'm joined in the office um, of Juro in London by a great panel. I have um, three speakers with me. Stephanie Stevenson, who's the um, service design lead at Lawyers on Demand. Um, we also have uh, with us uh, Fleur Kitchingman, who's the former general counsel at Carillion in Canada. And I have Mary Bonsall, who is the CEO and co-founder of Flex. Hi, everyone. Hello. Hello. I'm going to hand over to Mary. <laughs> Thanks so much, Tom. Um, so we're here to talk a little bit about Flock for the next hour. Um, just starting off, please, if we can, please, Stephanie, can you just explain to me what, what is Clock and what, what does it stand for? Yeah, absolutely. So I should probably say before getting going, I'm not a, um, I don't, I'm not, I'm technically in the ecosystem of Clock, so I see it from the outside in. But um, Clock's an organisation, it's the Corporate Legal Operations Consortium. It's an organisation that grew organically out of the West Coast US where legal operations grew up um, as a response to growing in-house teams and the need for more structure internally. Um, legal ops sort of developed there. Um, Clock grew, I think, out of a book club. So a group of the original founders started a book club and found they were talking more about their work than about the book. And so decided to formalise and, and start a group um, which had a really quick uptake. Um, and they especially recognised the lack of formal recognised training and um, sort of opportunities for networking within the operations field. So they began what is now CLOCK. Um, the conference we're talking about um, happened a couple of weeks ago. And was their second one in London. Um, they also had a conference last year, I think, in Sydney and the conference in Vegas which will be in its third or fourth year, I think, this year, um, is their main, um, main one. And as a general um, overview, I'd say it's a particularly open forum and it's really content-driven um, to a, sort of create this training structure that they felt was lacking in their space and industry. And Fleur, have you ever, have you ever attended? I have indeed. So I first came across Clock in 2017 when I heard about the Vegas conference they had then and I missed out on that one. I was... Um, really upset about that. So I made sure in 2018 I, I did attend the UK one and I attended the one, at, the one in Vegas. Um, both very, very different events. The, the, the first London one was very small in, in style um, and the Vegas one was, was a lot larger but both of them very kind of driven in terms of doing things better, smarter, faster um, and, and really having had good content. Amazing. And so um, focusing a little bit more on Clock 2019 and the most recent conference, one of the key themes seems to be all about metrics and data. What were the key takeaways, Stephanie, on this? Okay, so I thought Lisa Coney's talk was really great. She kept it really, really practical, and I think it's going to be worth saying about Clock and probably a lot of other conferences similar to it. There's people in the room who are a one-man band, just started out in legal ops and started from the beginning, and then there are organisations like Adobe who have got a long history of legal ops and lots of experience. So there's quite a wide audience, and Lisa kept it really practical and accessible which I thought was really great and she also made it really feel really real so she talked a lot about she starting with what you know and not worrying if you don't have a lot of data points um she made the point a lot um repeatedly which was i thought really valid that you keep it simple and gather what you've got and have a look at it but keep your team really involved because if you start gathering data in a sort of semi-surreptitious manner um, it puts everyone off and makes everyone feel really nervous about what you're doing with it. So one of the main points was keep your team in the loop as you build out reporting and get their views on what will be useful um, throughout. I don't know if that, you went to that one and be useful. Um, so I, I actually didn't attend that session. Um, in terms of uh, metrics, so generally, um, we, we measured things quite a lot of Carillion in particular, tracking external spend. I think from a practical point of view, I, I kind of agree that you don't, what, you can waste an awful lot of time trying to track and trying to measure everything. I think what you need to do is, is, is think about what's important to you, what's important to the business, um, and what, what you want to show the business or demonstrate to the business by tracking and measuring things, and, and, and what, you want to, what you want to progress and where's your pain points and kind of tracking and measuring those things. Um, so I think it's, it's important to kind of to understand that. Um, and then another point I think I'd make on metrics as well is be careful about your messaging on metrics because if you start turning around to, to the business and saying, oh, okay, we've measured this, we're making improvements, um, we've reduced internal legal time by X amount, then the challenge you often get back is, well, okay, can you come and reduce internal headcount then? So I think you have to be really careful about how you kind of message any metrics that you, and data that you do collect. Um, I mean, in my experience, it's, it's been the case that no matter how much you try and streamline things and make things more efficient, 
um, that there's always new problems coming down the line to kind of take the place of, of those things that you've streamlined and made more efficient. So I think by trying to do this, this, this exercise in terms of legal operations, making things better, smarter, faster, what you're trying to do is you're trying to re reduce the, the stuff that you're trying to increase the amount of things that you can standardise and make more efficient to create more headspace, to do the more strategic work with the business and to deal with tomorrow's problems. Mm -hmm. So I've never actually found that I've been able to reduce headcount as a result of legal operations. It just creates a bit more time and space to kind of do the value added things that, that you want to be doing rather than the, the things that you could standardise. Mm -hmm. And one thing that came across, actually it was in another one of the talks, it was very much about data, was it sounds really simple but the need to keep an eye on the quality of your data. I think it was um, Kerry Phillips from um, Vodafone did a session later on looking more at um, optimization, but she made the point that if your data is undermined or seems to be not robust, mm -hmm. it, the whole, all your argument is just blown away, especially the kind of from a legal background where maybe um, there's less of a background of reporting using metrics in that way. And, and she was really candid about the experience she had when someone within the organisation sort of pointed the finger and said, I don't think your data is right. And she had to do a whole overhaul, going through the real raw data to see what's going on. I think that's an easy one to miss. You think we're capturing it at the end. Mm -hmm. And actually, when you, when you look at it, you've got to ask those questions. So it's not going to capture stuff in a really manual way. Mm -hmm. Like people are using time recording systems, it's quite manual entry. And there might be an extra zero or, or something that's just not quite right. And challenging that's really important to me. I'm not merrily reporting something that's really great and really bad. Actually, it's exactly. exactly. And the reason why, why are you collecting that data? Yeah. What, what's the reason? And what do you want? What do you want to track from it? What do you want to solve? I think exactly. Exactly. And exactly. um, we find, especially when we do a fair amount of reporting to clients, and we get really overexcited by our beautiful graphs <laughs> <laughs> and show them loads of stuff. Now, isn't it great? And they look at it and go, "Oh, it's a lot of information. I don't really know what I'm looking at." But sometimes, actually, we need to. Take the, exactly to your point there, it takes that back and go, what are we actually trying to show? Maybe actually going back to some bullets with some words, the graph at the back end is a better way because we can spend lots of time looking at graphs when you put it up on the screen and you've only got half an hour to talk about it. That can almost be more of a red herring than as well. Do you, do you find that um, uh, kind of companies that you work with are really keen to find out more about what to track? Is this like something because one thing that was interesting about this session was that um, for a morning session of a conference, there are a lot of questions. Um, I'm sure we've all been to a lot of legal events and it can be a little bit sleepy get, in terms of um, getting hands up going in the early um, sessions. And there were so many people who had questions for Lisa and wanted to know about it. Is it like a hot topic when you go into companies? It is. And it's quite, it's quite a tricky one because we, exactly to Fleur's point, sort of ask clients what success is like. And then we try to think about how we, what we can measure to show that success. Mm -hmm. But sometimes, I don't think it's a particular criticism of our clients, hopefully not, that they often don't, it's hard to define that. And it's things like free up my time or all your lawyers are going ask the space to do different things. But quite what those things are aren't clear. So it can be a bit of a, at the beginning, we often just start with quite a short list of basic metrics, like how many matters or how many hours and some real, some really basic things. And then we build out from there. And it's quite surprising as well. The things that we think it's showing often will go to a meeting with clients. And you might have seen this when you were on the receiving end, but actually it shows them something quite different. So we can show and spend value in a certain category of contracts. And they'll say, oh, that's really interesting. Why have we got so many low value contracts? We'll go, oh, yeah, that is a good question. You don't ask for business. We hadn't really thought of that. We were looking at it from a really legal perspective. So um, it can have unattended insight, I guess. Yeah, definitely. And, and um, what, what do you, other than kind of the main things of spend, I always find time an interesting metric, which seems to be recorded a lot with lawyers, as you know, the billable hour is all about time so I imagine that's the kind of first place that people go to so have you found that yes I think because we're a supplier that's definitely something that we report on mm -hmm. um, especially well depending on the relationship we have with the client we definitely absolutely do report on hours and how long things are taking I think there's a real challenge in house with that there's a yeah. lot of sort of almost political people have left pro practice partly because they don't want to go through the rigmarole of time recording mm -hmm. and then say oh we've got this great plan you're going to time record <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> It's really tricky. I don't know if you've right. tried yeah. the time recording. So, yeah, time, time recording with internal lawyers is quite tricky, exactly for the reasons that you described. Um, and I think, I think you can get a bit bogged down as well if you're trying to record every single minute that someone spends doing something. But the time is better um, spent elsewhere. Mm -hmm. So in, in terms of in-house, I think it's much better just to get a flavour as to what proportion of time people are spending on certain things. So what proportion of time they're spending on disputes, what proportion of their time do they think they're spending on contract management. And, 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 and sometimes that, that can be just as valuable as, you know, getting minute by minute mm -hmm. data because they, they, have, they have a good sense as to how they're spending their time each week and, and what, what, focus, what they're focusing on. So in terms of 
how I how I did that at Quillian. It was more kind of having week, weekly meetings where we all talked about what matters we got on and what our main focuses were that week. And that gave enough of a gauge as to where people were spending their time to, be, to then be able to look for how do we improve certain processes and systems. I think we could do it. I think there was actually another another session. I don't think it's on our list to talk about, but um, a guy from Novartis, and apologies, he's got a really, really long name, so I'm trying to pronounce it. But he was talking about some of the operational efficiencies he's made, and he was saying exactly that. They just got the team, I think, to do a survey, just saying, well, what, what are the main things you're focusing on? And they did a lot of, we'll come on to that later, the change management and winning hearts and minds to persuade people, don't worry. If you're doing, if you're actually spending 90% of the time researching stuff, it's okay, just tell us. Mm -hmm. And then we'll know we've got a gap of, you know, ability or a gap of um, resource in the team. And actually, because of all the work they did up front for that survey, they had to do ridiculous, like a 95% return rate on people actually paying wow. it in for a big legal team, which he was really pleased with and showed that if you, if exactly that, if you persuade them you're doing it for the right reasons, then it's going to actually be a lot long run for help for them. They'll, they'll do it and want to engage to hopefully fill up their time to do more interesting stuff. Definitely, and it's just a change in mindset, isn't it? Because you're so used to when you're in private practice, you're calling every billable hour, but actually looking at what time is valuable <laughs> and then, um, with each matter. Okay, fab. So just moving on to the next point, um, looking a bit more specifically at technology within legal ops, was there any key theme that came away from this? Mm, yeah, um, there was a, a great quote from uh, Steve Harmon at Cisco that we featured. Um, in our Twitter feed, which was um, talking about buying a treadmill. And it was very much this idea that um, if you're kind of out of shape and you buy a treadmill and expect it to magically make you fit and athletic, then you've kind of misunderstood what you're doing and you haven't really worked out what the problem is that you have. Um, and I think there was a real kind of desire at the conference to have a better understanding of not just like what might help people in terms of solutions, but why do they need them in the first place? Um, yeah, so it was, a, it was a real hot topic at the conference. It's funny because um, with, with Flex, we're very much a startup, so we had to build a minimum viable product before going any further, and that's almost how we've developed. We've, we've just gone very slowly and organically, but building on tech where we see it necessary, where there are pain points. Is that something, Stephanie, which you would agree with, with the treadmill? Yeah, absolutely. I feel, I mean, I personally feel like there's a huge amount out there, and like the, we've got the Legal Geek startup map on there, and it shows how it started on the, in the middle and where it's gone to on the right, and it's, it's overwhelming. There's a huge mm. amount out there, and if, if you're trying to do a true RFI, you know, looking at the market, you, you could be here for a whole other year, and there'd be a whole other more <laughs> options, and you'd never get going on anything. So I think the real challenge is to know where to, especially if you're an in-house team, with that hat on, um, knowing where to kind of where to draw the line on that and say, okay, this is what we're going to go for. We're going to invest some time and money in it. But I think you're right. I think the main one of the main things I've come away with, and it's it's been a theme I think is growing over time, is what is the minute, what is the minimum product you need? What is the root to your point on? What's the what's the root cause of the issue? And what's the most basic thing we can do to fix it? And sometimes that's not even technology. That's a better process. It's different people doing the work. It's it's looking at a different way, it's getting data on it to see what's happening. And maybe if it is buying tech, could it be tech you've already got? Could it be, if you've got Office 365, could it be a functionality within that that could maybe help as a starting point? Do you need to spend the money in, especially in legal, do you even have the money? Mm -hmm. Are you going to be able to get budget? We've got more and more clients looking to piggyback off enterprise-wide sort of IT projects to see if they can get their legal requirements early enough to mean they've actually got a usable thing. And maybe that's a better use of time than, than I mean, and looking at the external market independently, maybe. Completely. And, and Fleur, talk, tell us a little bit about your experience as a GC in Korean. Did you implement any new tech solutions? Um, so we had limited um, tech um, at Korean. We had kind of an internal collaboration portal and things, and, and things like that. But in terms of actual tech solutions, as Stephanie was saying, often the solutions that we found were, were, were non-tech, quite simple, kind of quite um, pragmatic solutions. Um, I did look at some tech while I was in Quinnia, Canada, because you know, it's a very hot topic. It seems very exciting. There's an awful lot of, um, of hype, I think, in the marketplace at the moment around tech. Um, but what I, my experience was, you know, you have to be really careful about the, the tail wagging the dog here. Because I, I look at the tech and I think, well, okay, that, that could help us. If we change this and we change this and we change our processes and systems, yes, the tech could help. But then you don't really want to tech change your business processes and systems around technology. It really needs to be the tech that provides the solution that you need tailored around your business. Um, so that's really what I found. And we had um, Quillian Advice Services, of course, already uh, in, in Quillian. Um, so a lot of our um, you know, 
a lot of things that you would historically you would use tech for, like contract management, we'd already got Quillian Advice Services, which are our internal paralegals, that, that would help us at a much kind of lower cost and higher quality, really, than, than the tech solutions. I mean, the other thing I found with tech as well is, you know, there's not really a silver bullet. Tech doesn't help you with everything, you know, just press a button and it magically helps you when you use all your contracts. It helps you with an element, it helps you with a percentage of it, so you still need human resource on top. So it's not a silver bullet solution. So there's the kind of the issues that I, I, I told you with um, while I was putting Canada on tech. And someone um, said, which I think was a really good point, that actually when a tech provider comes to you and gives a, a smart demo, be allowed to fiddle with it and get the people who are actually going to use the tech to play with it. Because it's all very well as a, you know the, the top GC saying, yeah, that looks great, but mm -hmm. maybe the paralegal working for it who's going to be running it will say, actually, it's really missing something. And I think that's a, quite a key message, is making it relevant to the relevant teams and people. They called it sandboxing. Sandboxing. I thought was great. <laughs> <laughs> they got sandboxing. <laughs> yeah, oh, I, I was actually going to say a really similar talk to that and, and make the point that I think sometimes we get to the bottom of getting the voice of the customer, meaning the internal customer, the business user that will be using an instruction portal, or whoever might be interacting with the product, get their voice quite early because we, I think it came out in a few different ways at the conference, but legal can be quite insular and sort of forget about the fact they are normally buying a service to their in-house clients and trying to pr produce something because always want to produce the, the highest quality, best, immediately perfect output, so to forget that actually maybe a more agile, iterative approach, like may you're describing your relationship to have sex developed, mm -hmm. that might be a better way to engage uh, business who are more used to working that way themselves rather than trying to wow them with a tool that they can't use and they've never heard of and no one's asked them about. Yeah, I think that, that's another problem with, with tech as well. It's not, it might not just affect the legal department, it affects the whole of the business. Um, and the business might have something already that they're using that legal could just tag on the back of. So it, it's, a, it's, it's a process that involves the whole of business generally rather, rather than just the legal department, depending on what the tech is. And I suppose we'll get onto it when we start to talk about change management. There's an awful lot of change management that goes um, in, it, in implementing tech. There's an awful lot you have to do to try and get people to use different systems, different ways of working, and that, that can be challenging as well. Yes, I think, Mary, you used the phrase, um, uh, doing the hard work, work in the spreadsheets, um, which is probably not something that lawyers particularly like to hear. I don't know if I'm being <laughs> unkind there, but like, can you talk a bit more about that in terms of um, if you're trying to scope out something minimum viable? Um, do you think lawyers are kind of equipped to do that? How can they get started? Yeah, I think it's just beginning. So it, it almost think about what data you need to track and put it into a spreadsheet. So mm -hmm. a kind of prime example with us was our timesheets, sending out lots of timesheets. Mm -hmm. I used to manually do it by going through each Google Doc, changing the, the week by week of the name, and it took absolutely hours. <laughs> and James would watch me and think, you know, it's taking you so much time, mm -hmm. actually a small bit of tech. Will mean we can automate this by just pressing one button and it will send out timesheets to everyone. So he was looking at, I suppose that's where tech can help you be a bit more efficient by looking at me spending all day, unfortunately, <laughs> sending out timesheets and him saying actually tech can help with that and automate the kind of inefficiency the efficiency with that. Yeah. I think that's a really great example of how someone with James I don't think has a legal background. No. He's coming at it from a different perspective and it's very lean six to kind of follow the process and literally physically follow it. So over your shoulder off you in a factory, follow the cog as it goes. But if you do that you really quickly pick up on some quite what might be perceived as strange or like inefficient ways of working yeah. and just grow up organically to just try to get something done to have time to do that it differently. So I think there's a real value, especially in um, businesses that are growing, having people with different perspectives. And, and I guess they're open enough to peer over each other's shoulders and not take it offensively when someone suggests you could maybe do something a bit quicker. Yeah, which is also hard with you know, um, lawyers, I suppose, because you are risk averse, so you don't really want someone sitting over you saying, you're doing that terribly. You know? So <laughs> yeah, but I think, I think innovation, for innovation to happen, you have to be open to, to that and let people have their different opinions and, and say that actually that is really efficient. I mean, James was saying this is a complete waste of your time and he was quite, quite right. <laughs> um, but yeah, I completely agree. Having, having different perspectives only in, in helps innovation. It's interesting though, from a kind of, I suppose, law firm perspective, how do you do that? Because quite often the technologists are sitting miles away from where you are as the lawyers. So I suppose, you're just thinking out loud, but one way is to make all your processes very visible and you do that through data, right? Yeah, and there was also, I thought it was quite encouraging that one of the, um, I can't remember, it might have been Vodafone, but one of the very, very big companies on stage was just saying, we just borrowed the IT, IT help desk sticking system. 
um, mm. rather than doing all of this like expensive procurement and stuff like that. Um, and it, it's kind of, I, I think some large companies worry that, um, you know, the, the legacy systems are so big that they don't have the luxury of going to find like the exact nature of the problem and then find something um, that fits it perfectly. But even in a um, kind of a company of that size, it's still possible to experiment with stuff because um, the business by its you know, nature has procured a whole load of tools over the years. Um, and lawyers just might not have used them or thought mm. to use them or been forced to use them, more likely. <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think it was um, Karen Bergman as well, that she had a secondee, she managed to persuade, I think it was her. Well, another one of the big businesses on stage was saying they managed to persuade someone to come onto Common, either from a finance or from IT, to kind of come and have a look at what's happening in legal. And that person ended up staying and becoming part of the ops team and adding real value. So if there is, I think it's a really great idea to use, not just the tech you've got internally, but the people who might be interested in coming to a different part of the business and adding some value. You know, what's interesting with that as well as millennials generally, we did a big survey to all our paralegals and um, 38% of them said actually they'd like to move around different areas through their career. And I think that's a great opportunity to, to, to bring, kind of put them into finance and learn a bit more about that or put them into innovation teams to learn about that. Mm. And that's actually would suit a millennials, kind of, instead of potentially sitting on the treadmill to become a partner, Perhaps they don't want that. Perhaps they want a bit more flexibility to try out these different different areas of, of law. Yeah, and I think with legal operations um, in particular, it's really multidisciplinary in terms of being able to borrow people from other functions. So we've, we've been doing a bit of um, content with Monzo lately, and their um, early hires in legal weren't other lawyers. They were operations managers and people who understand how to scale a function really fast because that's what you need at Monzo because um, it's hiring 30 people at a time. So um, I think kind of that, that um, kind of, freedom to, to borrow people or hire people from other disciplines. I think it's really important in finding the actual problem that you're solving and addressing it with the right kind of skills. Mm, definitely. It'd be mm. interesting to see as legal ops develops, it feels that there's a lot of people within it are former lawyers who have shifted into more operations role fairly organically, and then there are people who are non-lawyers who have found their way into legal and are doing operations work. Uh, operations work. It'll be interesting to see how that develops and, and which which end up with dominance, whether it's sort of specialism within legal, most people are lawyers, or whether it ends up being more of an external perspective. Mm. I think there's a lot that legal departments can learn from their businesses as well. I mean, in terms of Carillion, as, as a business, we did project management and we did procurement. Those were our two big things that we did. So when, you, when you, you've got those specialisms already as a, as a business, then to transfer those into the legal department is, is, is quite powerful. Mm. Um, I think there's, there's other businesses like tech companies and those kinds of companies where, where you can do a similar thing, I think, you can transfer the business knowledge into the legal department and, and benefit from that. So I think there's a yeah, huge potential in terms of diversity of thought there. Definitely. Brilliant. Well, that, um, let's go on to our next question. So more generally, what, um, what will innovation mean in 2019? Mm. <laughs> <Because> <laughs> <laughs> I, think, I think we thought of this one because, because of the, the final, the closing address that's on the slide, which Saskin got up and did quite a stirring, dramatic kind of presentation all around, stopped on the tweak processes and introduced a bit of tech, let's go start again and go, go extreme. And, and that wasn't really, it was quite a, quite a different way of putting things because most of the rest of the conference have been about incremental change and process improvements, all the things we've talked about, and then he got up there and said it's just not going to be enough. So it was quite, um, yeah, it was quite a dramatic end to the conference. Mm. But in, interesting to see which way it'll go. He said something like, the next 10 years won't be, no, was it the next 10 years won't be transformative, but the following 10 will be, you know, you'll see that big change then. So it's sort of small, 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 big. Thing it's there. interesting that, isn't it? Because it's, it's a bold statement, but for lawyers in particular, it's even bolder. People who tend to be a bit more risk averse and um, don't necessarily like lots of change. And I speak, I mean, being a lawyer, so I, 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 I can say that fairly. And um, so trying to kind of invent something completely and transform uh, the industry completely sounds to me like that would be difficult to embrace for lawyers. It takes a lot of mental space to come up with what that could look like. If mm. people already, everyone, I think anyone seeing it saying, oh, I'm not busy, I've got loads of days just to muse on how my team could work, <laughs> how I could replace my team with robots, and people are desperately trying to find time and resource to do a bit of process mapping or, or think about how their IT ticking system could work. So to do the big overhaul is it's quite daunting. Mm. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was a, it's an interesting um, question because he... At one point he um, made the claim, I'm not sure if this is true, but I don't have any reason to doubt it, that um, about 90% of the um, kind of 
fast-paced innovation uh, driven by technology that we've seen in legal has been aimed at private practice law, really. And that, for the most part, um, in-house legal is still really ripe for innovation and lots of processes we could look at. Um, I don't know, do you think that's fair? I mean, Flo, you, you were at one place for a, very, for, for a relatively <laughs> long time, so you could see the kind of sweep of how technology was introduced and processes changed. Do you think that that's a fair accusation in-house still has a lot of work to do in that area? Um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think there's probably not a single corporate legal department out there that doesn't think they could do things better, smarter, faster, given the time, given the resources. Um, so, yes, I think that's, that's, that's fair comment. Um, from my perspective, I, I, I think that probably the conversation of the future is, is probably less, less around what are legal doing right now and how can we do it better, smarter, faster but probably looking at, are we doing the right things in the first place? Um, so kind of get going back and saying, well, okay, what, what are we doing? Are we doing the right things? How does legal add value? Um, how can we use our, our business resource better? Because um, I think there's a, we spoke about it earlier, there's a lot of resource actually in the business as well that you can bring into legal. And, and less thinking about legal in terms of the, you know, we're, we're, we're very bespoke, what we do is very bespoke, and we're lawyers and we're the only people that can do that, just opening ourselves up more um, in terms of how we, how we do things with the business and how we operate with the business. Um, how do we align ourselves more with, with business objectives? Um, particularly, I think, in this, this age of kind of disruption, I don't think there's a single industry or sector out there that's not being disrupted in some way. So I think that leads to the legal department having to be much more flexible and adaptable as time goes on to kind of flex with all these business changes. Um, so it, it, it might be that, that that's, that's more the kind of the transformative change that, that Richard was talking about. Mm. I think maybe he made a really good point, the last bit on the left of the slide around legal education and how are we really preparing, and we meaning as an industry, preparing the lawyers of the future or the legal ops people of the future to be great? Because mm -hmm. the education is still preparing lawyers for sort of the best 20th century, maybe 19th century law. And <laughs> actually, when you look at, and it's obviously something which is written a lot about, around all the different jobs there could be within legal, like legal project management, engineering, etc., that just doesn't really exist very much on many courses and law courses at the moment. So we've got this gap at the beginning where people are entering the, entering the profession without really a clear understanding of the kind of skills they might need to have a grip on flat letter law. And then possibly, or maybe maybe a bit more divisively, a gap where people want to go in house and they've come from a fee earning background where they are the they are the output of their business to an in-house department where suddenly they're providing a service. And I think there's a possibly a real gap on this of understanding of what am I here to do. What is the mm. point of legal in-house? What is my purpose? And a lot of clients have said to us when they've polled their employees on this, they've said, oh, to respond to the business need and do, do what they need, you know, basically be really responsive to whatever they think they need. And actually, that surprised a lot of people in senior positions that say, no, we're here to be the voice of risk or be the person mm. advising the board on the direction. And there's a real disconnect between sometimes people with a more junior level in-house in and what the, the GC might say about what their purpose is. It's interesting because um, I think law schools are definitely beginning to introduce different mm -hmm. modules now with technology. So I know BPP have introduced one and Swansea University are quite forward thinking in that regard. But it, it's almost because they've had to because there's all these new technologies. And with our um, paralegals, the most popular roles are the ones from replacing people into tech companies. So more than kind of going to the traditional law firm, actually, what people want is to go into a tech company to see how it's going to be different and learn different mm -hmm. skills, which is um, it's quite interesting. Yeah, I think it's a whole different world out there now than it was when I first kind of qualified into the profession. Um, with all the alternative legal services providers, all the tech companies, the kind of changing role, I think, of the, the in-house legal department, changing law firms as well in terms of new roles. It's, it's a whole different world. And I suppose the question is, are we preparing the younger generation for that coming forward? Um, and yeah, bar, bar a few exceptions, I think they're, they're still teaching the same law course that, that I attended. <laughs> so. How do you think the young people, because um, obviously you, you make it sound so old, <laughs> the young people. The young, I've heard of them, I've seen them, um, and Mary, you work with them. So, uh, like, as you kind of alluded to, there used to be a progression where it's like, you go to a great school and then you go to a great law firm, hopefully, and maybe eventually you move in house, maybe for reasons of work-life balance or whatever. Um, and I don't think that's the case anymore, but, um, this idea that um, you know, if you're coming out of uni and you're a really desirable graduate, you could either go to um, work at one of the magic circle firms, give up like 16 hours a day for about five years and then get paid lots of money, 
or you could go on a secondment to Google. Like, I, I suppose the balance of power shifting in favor of what, what's more attractive to those students, like, is that something that you see? Has that changed even in the time that you've been, been working? Yeah, here? definitely. Yeah. I think um, it's interesting because we quite ask, often ask them what, what flexibility means to them. And it's not being allowed to work from home for one day a week. It's more, I want to be able to go, I've got other interests. So I want to go to be able to play in my cricket game mm -hmm. and then come back and I'm happy to work late. But I just want that flexibility to follow my other passions. And I think um, particularly the younger generation, potentially you have lots of other things going on in your life or there's an opportunity to because now everything's on your phone. So mm -hmm. if you want to use it, you can find music and gigs just around the corner. So I think it's more allowing people the ability to move around a bit in their career. I don't think this kind of um, one way shot to becoming a partner is necessarily going to appeal to, to lots of the younger generation. And, and that's why Legal Ops is, is very exciting because I think it will entice a lot of people in um, who, who you know, have been a lawyer and want to try out something else or go off into legal design or you know, there's so much opportunity for them at the moment, which, which is great. Yeah. Maybe that's also driven by um, the resourcing side as well, because you know you used to have junior lawyers doing those roles because big companies would pay for them, but now there are lots of more flexible um, providers who can provide like a flex resource if there's a big IPO coming up or something. Um, and you, you look at that bill of a you know a law firm sending you five associates for like six months or whatever, and it's, it's an extraordinary amount of money. Um, so I guess as client demand has changed, maybe the supply has changed as well in that regard. I'm not sure if that's well, theory. I think we definitely see clients thinking at a more granular level about what kind of resource they need for different activities. Um, so rather than saying, okay, we've got these law firms, oh, I'll just talk to them, I'm talking to them, I'm an I'm m &A project anyway, I'll just talk to them about this other piece of property litigation. So really don't because I'm already kind of on my phone mm -hmm. and I'll just to a partner. They have, I think, probably from pressure from their CFO and other paths that in their business, they're thinking a bit more, you know, do I believe the law firm is? If so, which law firm? Mm -hmm. If not a law firm, is it a family complex? Is it a law firm ID? Is it, is it a hire? Is it, what, what do I actually need? And trying to be a bit more thoughtful about that, which gives more opportunity to, to different, probably different law firms as well as different providers as well. Definitely, and break it up a bit, instead of it just a bit of work coming into a partner and it automatically going to a senior associate actually looking at what the work is, mm -hmm. splitting it up and saying, actually, that bit should be done by tech, that bit should be done by uh, kind of, flexible resource and that bit yes should be done by the senior system. And I think that's probably my guess would be it's a big reason why that we've seen many more tech targeted at law firms to your point on because of e billing being one of the most of all the things on the tech legal ops radar as one of the most entry so it seems like quite an entry level thing for people to fix, get their billing sorted for their external suppliers, they can at least look at what they're sending. And when you get to that level of detail you can start to think, okay that's quite interesting, I spent that much over here and that's that really helps um in house teams break it down and decide what, where the value is for their different law firms rather than their massive bill once a month and hope that it was broadly resorted in the right way. Mm. Yeah, but that's something you looked at, Claire. Yeah, I mean, we were quite, we were quite lucky at Quillian because we had Quillian Advice Services, so we had our internal paralegal um, operation there, which really kind of encouraged us to do exactly that and basically disaggregate the resource because we had paralegals there available to, to do the work, so then we, were, we had a, you know, a massive amount of work to do. So it was a case of looking at you know, what work we have to do and how can we kind of disaggregate resource so that we got good advice services doing as much as they possibly could to support us. And we started kind of incrementally and it started with the you know, traditional NDAs, then we kind of built up some really quite complicated construction contracts in the end, including you know, in the UK and in the Middle East and, and in Canada, um, which saved us as internal lawyers a, a lot of time. And, they, they did most of the work around that, and then we kind of go in and just the internal lawyers' role was then to just kind of go and um, check what they'd done and do the kind of quality assurance around it. Um, so we really kind of forced to do that. I mean, and using kind of different resource, then you kind of uh, that then forces you to kind of process map things mm. and kind of work out who's going to do what, how does the whole process work, which then kind of encouraged us to kind of come up with better systems and processes and, and, and all the rest of it so that we could disaggregate resources. And we saved an awful lot of time and money and effort in, in doing that, and which would be then focus on other things. Mm. There, there was a, um, just one point I want to make on here, there's a session on smart collaboration. I'll give you the spot for that. Um, right. Because <laughs> <laughs> uh, it, it was very much about um, how lawyers can play better with other functions. Um, how do you think that goes at big corporates? Do you think uh, it's some uh, room for improvement? What's, what's your been, uh, experience been like of legal playing with other functions? 
Um, I found acrylic it actually worked really well. I think the important point is, you know, thinking what's the pain point you're trying to solve. So I can think of one kind of collaborative exercise where we took on, um, we did an acquisition of a, a cleaning services business, um, which resulted in lots and lots of volumes of contracts coming through. Um, didn't really want to have um, an internal lawyer's time spent with you know, cleaning contracts, which were generally kind of low risk, but high volume. Um, so we worked with the new business that we'd acquired, we worked with our existing management team in Canada as well. So cross-functionally, uh, worked very closely with the commercial, uh, one of the commercial managers there as well. Um, and all kind of sat around a table and said, okay, how do, how do you think we can do this in a kind of cost-effective, efficient way? Um, minimising the amount of risk um, and, and still having the same amount of quality. And we did a couple of workshops where we kind of worked through what, what the issues were and the risks were. Um, got the business kind of the business inputted into that and said this is what we're worried about, this is what we're concerned about. Um, and then we kind of developed a series of guidance notes um, that then actually Korean Advice Services ended up reviewing the contracts together with the guidance notes. Um, so we came up with a solution really where we were able to acquire a new business and deal with all their, their contracts with Korean Advice Services. I think that worked really well because everyone was investing in it because the commercial people didn't want to spend a lot of time and resource looking at contracts involved in that process. We internally as legal didn't also want to spend a lot of time and effort dealing with that. So we had the, the drive and the burning platform really to kind of get together and to do something about it. Um, and the business were really happy with the kind of result that we had as, as, uh, going through that collaborative exercise. So I think where there's a, where there's a burning platform, where there's a vested interest in doing something, I, th I think it works quite well. Now, that brings us nicely actually into the next point. Do you think collaboration really helps manage change management? Yes, I think you have, you have <laughs> to do that. Because we all know that um, yeah. even these graphs show that, that lawyers tend to be highly sceptical and, and that um, quite often goes against kind of innovation and, and causes problems with change management. Yes. So perhaps that's, that's the answer is, is collaboration. Yeah, I think I think as lawyers as well, you want to you want to produce something that's a good product, and you want it to be perfect, and you want it to get it ready to go, and then you want the, the temptation is to do all that work first before involving anybody else in the process. But I think that's in my experience that's wrong. <laughs> um, what, what's the best idea is really to kind of just have some broad discussions with people first about what the idea is or what the pain point is you're trying to solve work through what the issues are and really kind of bring everybody along with you in that change journey and in my experience in terms of change management it has to be done very very gradually um, so I'm quite a detailed person <laughs> um, temptation is really to go, to go go with a lot of detail about how, how great the change is going to be whereas I think really it's better just to have those very kind of high level conversations to start with and I think through having those conversations and getting everybody's input what you end up with at the end is something that's a lot more user friendly and, and, and a lot better in terms of a, of a product um, at the end of it because you've had all those discussions and you've kind of built up to it and you've, you've brought the business and, and the legal department along with you so that's, that's really my experience on change management I think we we often underestimate how difficult change management is as well and how long it takes. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you might think of a great idea, you might think of just press a button and everything's going to magically be fantastic. Um, in my experience, it hasn't been like that at all. People are very risk averse, particularly lawyers, don't like change. Um, it, it does take a very, very long time, it's small baby steps. So I think the other point I make on change management is I think it's much better to focus on a couple of key things that are going to be most impactful and make the biggest difference than it is to try and think like, okay, I've got 45 things I could do here, um, let's do them all now. I think that, that's being be very kind of strategic in how you prioritise things and what you do and when you do them, I think is really, really important. Mm -hmm. It a couple, of, a couple of those points there. One, maybe it's facetious but I sometimes think legal come across a bit like that friend who only gets in touch when they need something such a desire to get things to the absolute most advanced point they can be for exactly. asking for any help which you could perceive as you know very proactive and very you know, take, you know real close eye to take ownership but equally the calling IT saying hi I want to report this new thing next month can you get any resource? That, that's not going to get down that well. Whereas if you've taken the time, maybe in a slightly more a softer way, to grab a coffee with your IT counterpart and just chat about stuff, build them up to the idea that you might need their help, rather than going with this really direct request because you've sort of not bothered to, to, to your point to bring them on the journey with you and 
maybe not have all the answers, but have a chat and, and begin to kind of make friends, basically. <laughs> so when you need the help, you, you feel like you've got some best interest to ask. I think we really miss that. And I really like the point as well about picking some low-hanging fruit, picking some things you can do quite quickly. And chatting to a client actually on this talk to the other day, he said, actually what worked really well is getting a team, so putting up some options on a, on a sort of village style pin board. So like, these are the kind of things we're thinking of, what would you most like to see it spoken on first? Mm -hmm. And hoping that people don't go, changing our bring the dog to work office policy, <laughs> and, you know, can we start football team? And go for something possibly slightly more work related, but, but get some views on that and then be seen to quite quickly make the easy change and get the feedback on it and then do it again. And that way build the trust that people are going to be heard have their views taken into account and then see results. And that way you can move on to the bigger, bigger, less bite-sized projects that perhaps take a bit more effort and you don't see the change quite so fast. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think um, one, one reason why I wanted to um, make sure that the slide was in the presentation, we talked about it. Um, Dr. Larry Richard, the um, at Lawyer Brain, uh, uh, it was a very long session at the conference actually, in, in quite some detail dug into the psyches of the, uh, the lawyers and the audience, maybe a little bit too deep because they're lagging <laughs> It was really, really interesting, but obviously Clock is kind of, you know, the audience is like the biggest, some of the biggest companies in the world. And um, last week we had a, a breakfast for some tech GCs at some very small companies, and we asked them to um, kind of tell us what their priorities were for the next year and things they're worried about, and they all said change management as well. Um, so it's obviously kind of on the mind of legal departments, at this, you know, right at the bottom in terms of headcount and right at the top as well. Um, and I think it was a really interesting theme that, um, you know, most of the vendors, for example, who were sponsoring um, our club, like we were, were tech providers, but um, change management is not tech at all. Um, and like, it goes back to that working out uh, what your problem um, is before you try to solve it um, point. And also realizing that the, the main work is around people and making sure that people use what you buy or, or, or that they're invested in your project. Um, I mean, you, uh, you guys both go into big companies um, with your uh, resource solutions. So, do you find that change management is, is difficult for people at every level of, of business? I'd say at a broad level, yes. I think, in a way, in a small business, it's a very generic statement, but you have just got less people to deal with. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's possible you just get around and everyone you want, but maybe more likely to have systems like Slack or collaborative team-based environments where it is a bit easier to quite easily communicate. Whereas the big organisations we work for, they are dealing with legacy systems and no one wants to read another lengthy email about some change they're not sure how to relate to them, they have to kick off buttons and do surveys. So I think it's different challenges in different places, but I think in everywhere we go there tend to be, tend to be challenges. And we often find our, our lawyers, because they have a background in flexible resourcing and they tend to do multiple assignments, they've had experience in different industries, they can well end up starting doing a a general commercial contract role and not being pulled into more projects stuff because they've got insights from other industries how things get done. And that's something I think people forget the importance of to your point you made earlier, Mary, about sort of seeing things differently and trying to come up with some different perspective, especially mm -hmm. so you don't become too institutionalised and have some thoughts. Completely and we we I mean as a startup it's a lot easier to do this. But we have every every week a kind of meeting with even our paralegals who are in temporary basis to come in and get, get their thoughts on how we can do things differently. Differently, I think that's really important because it's getting different perspectives from every different bit of the business on something that they actually think we could improve on. And as um, Stephanie said, it's, it's easier when you're, when you're a small company, but you can do that within your teams. And I think, as, um, as you said, Blair, allowing people to have a voice mm -hmm. and feel like their opinion is, is counted towards something and bring them on the journey of this change is, is the way to make them feel excited by it. I think actually one a really simple tip or suggestion at the beginning of a project is take the time to identify your stakeholders, mm -hmm. not just in the legal but externally, and then you can frankly stick a poster on the side of your computer screen and look at that list regularly and go, gosh, I haven't spoken to them for a while. Mm -hmm. They've got no idea what's going on. Pick up the phone. Because otherwise it's really difficult. You've, you've never you'd never just get started because you can't talk to everyone in an organisation. But if you give careful thought to the key, the key people who are influencers in their department, maybe they're the cynics that you need to persuade up front. If you get them on board, they'll persuade everyone else. They'll use it. It's got to be okay. Um, and that makes a huge amount of difference. And with tech getting um, better and better, remote working becoming easier mm. and easier, it's going to become even more important because if you're sitting at home in a part of a remote team and you're not feeling engaged with where the company's going or the change that's happening, you'll feel completely disengaged and kind of switch off. So I think um, kind of change management or incentivising and bringing people collaborating together is just becoming, going to become more and more important. Yeah, I think there was, um, we, we interviewed a few people um, 
at the conference, um, which you find on our blog. And uh, one of them was Amy Hayden at um, Cambridge University Press, quite new to legal operations. Um, and she said one of the first things that she did when she took the role was went on a change management course. Um, and now she's a qualified change management practitioner. It's just like the idea that um, it's actually quite a new legal um, function at Cambridge University Press. They had very few lawyers for a long time. And then the previous GC um, hired about 30, I think. So then trying to ret retroactively fit a 30-person legal department on a huge global company is probably quite difficult. Um, so I think uh, a big part of her remit when she started was um, working out how to push those processes through and how to find out uh, where the bottlenecks are, but also deal with them, as you say, kind of tactfully working with the right people to speak to, um, which is going to be a real challenge, I think. Um, um, Okay, uh, I'm just going to take a second to plug our legal operations uh, book. <laughs> um, if you're one of the few people who hasn't yet downloaded it, please do. It's um, info.joy.com slash ebook. Um, and in there, there's about a dozen um, uh, experts and thought leaders from companies like Microsoft, Monzo, Pearson, um, all sharing some practical insights on how to um, uh, affect legal operations in your company right now today. Um, okay, so we're going to move on to questions now. Um, We've received um, plenty of questions during the webinar, but if you still want to send in live questions, there's still time. Um, and we're just going to throw them at Mary and make her answer them. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to move to Mary now. She has the list of questions. Thank you for sending those up. Okay, so this is a question which is probably for, for both of you to answer. Um, what do you do if you don't have the bu budget to make radical trans transformative changes happen? How, what would you suggest as the kind of first step? I would say, and this probably won't be that popular, but get into the process mapping. All you need is a piece of paper and a wall and a load of post-its. So you don't need any really any money. You need some time, admittedly. It takes, I do um, quite a lot of process mapping with clients as part of my role, and it takes a certain logical mindset, but basically you just have to ask that one of the key tenants is ask why an annoying amount of times. So it's something you <laughs> keep asking them why. Try not to put them totally offside, but, but try to get down to know why did you do it that way. Um, and then put everything onto post-its on the wall. There's also a free tool called elements.cloud, which, which we use. It's, it's a free process mapping tool, drag and drop, very intuitive um, to use. So you can use that as a, instead of a PowerPoint or an Excel, depending on your preference, to, to get the thing electronic. Um, and that makes a humongous difference. I've seen countless times when getting, getting cards to process that has never been that easy because it's really unsexy. They just keep saying, get me the people, get me the tech, it's going to be fine. And actually, if you don't you know the process, you struggle with both things. But when you take the time, always, there's almost always a light bulb moment that people around the room go, oh, you do it that way, huh? And then you begin to realise there's some easy inefficiencies that you could iron out just by having everyone on the same page and making some other resourcing decisions or existing system decisions. So that would be an idea. I agree with um, what Stephanie says. Um, I suppose we never really have massive budgets at Carillion to, to you know, buy fancy new tech or anything like that. But there's an awful lot you can do with, with no budgets um, in terms of you know, process mapping as you suggest. But then also I wouldn't underestimate the using business resource. Um, so a lot of the things we did at Carillion were, were things like working out what do we need to, where do we need to focus our attention. So when we're reviewing a contract, what are the risks that are really important to the business and that we think should be kind of dealt with? And, and focusing on those things rather than focusing on everything and just deciding you know, exactly where the focus should be. But then we've also got um, the business self review, some of the kind of low value, um, low risk contracts themselves, but we gave them the tools to be able to do that in terms of the guidance notes, the training, um, and, and then kind of a simple reference points and when and how to use us. So we, we used a lot of a business resource to help support us in, in the legal team as well. So don't underestimate the power of the resource that's out there. If it's not in the legal team, it might be somewhere else in the business or there might be tech somewhere else in the business. There might be something there in the business that you can, you can pull in and use even if you haven't got the budget yourself to employ extra people or to buy tech or to, to do any fancy things. So I think that, those, are the, those are the two key points. I think making sure you're very, very, very focused on the on things that matter and not, not concentrated on everything, but also kind of looking to see if there's any resource in the business you can use. I think actually, sorry, just another thing I thought of while I was saying that, around some simple assessment of what your department's doing at the moment, which doesn't really take any external resource, but simply, and it's another one of the session, think about what activities are done today, which you can gather by surveying, sitting around a table, writing a list. H how should they be done? So a bit of thinking about what, what takes seemingly an unnecessary amount of time or feels mm -hmm. like a burden to people, and then who should do them. You know, 
is it and include things like what are external accounts are currently doing include that in the mix and then reconsider who should be doing what and you can use things if you, and like an eisenhower matrix which is just really urgency versus priority urgency versus priority and trying to understand where your activities sit on that that can be quite a nice way of with it, with your whole team thinking about what they're currently doing and maybe where there are gaps that's a important point actually in terms of resource it's considering all resource not just internal legal team external resource business resource any any other resource that you can kind of lay your hands on and then work out really what, what's the best mix in terms of the, the budget or, the, or, or what you've got to play with in terms of resource how can you put all that together creatively and effectively and efficiently and effectively you don't actually to carry out surveys now that they're sending you free so mm. to collect this data is, is it easy to actually collect because of these surveys so mm. almost as you say get ask other people ask what they would change ask mm. them what, what's their pain points and see what they say yeah and a big thing that we heard out of crop was the whole the adage of don't fix it till it's broke isn't really going to stick you need mm. to fix it before it's totally broken and <laughs> just talking the things that are nearly broken is kind of a key skill but actually uh gc who we talked to the day who joined an organization who hadn't had a sort of a GC equivalent before. So what he did was said immediately, right, we're going on an offsite. I know it's a day out of everyone's time, but frankly, we need to we need urgently to look at the big picture here because otherwise there's no changes are going to be made. So I think that probably the payoff, if you've not got the budget to get an external consultant in, you're going to have to ask your team to take the time and maybe maybe manage expectations of your business that you're going to need a few months that and maybe not be as good as quickly spare while you work out which way mm -hmm. you want to go. Yeah, I think um uh, I like the the general point about not needing any technology to try and solve problems in the first place is that we, we wrote something for Lean the other day, which is very much about that, how to uh, innovate without technology. Um, and it was just borrowing the Google framework of leaning on a lot of post-its, getting everyone together. Now, Google presumably don't struggle with budget. They've got quite a lot of money there, but they know like that's a really effective way to solve problems. So I think taking a cue from not even just elsewhere in business, but also other industries is really useful. Definitely. Okay, next question. Um, so at what stage is a company ready for a legal operations function or role? How do you identify this? Oh, <laughs> so I could start that one off. I would, I, would say, um, I would say bring one in straight away. I think as a startup, you're constantly reviewing and looking at data and because you have to, because your time, you, know, you, you don't have the budget and, and you're constantly reviewing your KPIs. And I would argue that this is actually one of the most important things a legal department should be doing. So bringing one in almost from the start to look at what data you should start tracking or how you can be more efficient so you don't get to the stage when it's broken and you have to fix it um, would, be, would be a suggestion. <laughs> I think it's an interesting question to ask is probably if you're, you're right at the beginning and you're the first lawyer into a new business, you probably end up doing an ops role. I mean, realistically, what are you doing day to day? You're probably you may not call yourself a legal operations person, but but you may well be doing a lot of the things that's on the top wheel of competencies in terms of panel review and thinking about how the how how you should receive instructions, etc. Our um, main question is, is sort of more how you label it in a way. And we find a lot of the time our lawyers join teams for you know optically general commercial role, and they end up doing a lot of operations and strategy because that's what's needed to get a get new function going within a business. So I'd say you're probably right, you're probably right at the beginning, it's just you might not, depending on how you get your budget and how you justify things, you might not call it the <laughs> yeah. operations, you might call it none pair of hands, mm -hmm. and, and end up, then it might end up doing quite a lot. Well, we never actually had anybody dedicated to legal operations at Carillion, which is interesting. Um, what generally tended to happen is we were, we were all kind of tasked with looking at how to do things better and more efficiently, um, yeah, kind of better, smarter, faster. Um, and I, th I think what actually happened is some, some people took to it quite well and really kind of passionate about it and other people perhaps perhaps less so but it generally worked because in effect we were all doing an element of legal operations um, and that, that worked for us. I think it probably just depends on the organisation and what works best for the organisation and how large the organisation is. And I suppose the legal operations role itself might, might change as time goes on. Um, as the business changes and grows, you might need different kind of specialist expertise as, as, as time goes on. So I think it, it probably is very kind of dependent on the actual on the, on the business itself. Did you, when you had um, into the Korean, did you tie um, legal ops type work into people's objectives? Yes, it was. Yeah, it's very much so. It's very much the um, house of people's objectives. I think that makes a huge difference. Mm -hmm. I've heard that a lot from clients when they've gone to small problems and know 
you know, beginning of you know the proposal period or financial year, we've mm -hmm. you know, part of the objective setting is not just legal output but operations as well, and that that's been the thing that's really solidified in people's minds. It isn't something that you go to the bottom of the to do list every week and never get done. It's the actual mm -hmm. output that has to be delivered. Yeah, because I think the last thing you want to do is have a legal operations person and then not have the legal team bought into it. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, so so it's 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 a strike a balance, I think, between saying, well, that's a legal operations person, that's their role, but also it's the whole of the legal team's um, responsibility to support that person. Yeah, I, I like that, putting it on every individual to give them a bit of legal operations to do. Mm -hmm. And that the people that are doing the role generally have more of a sense as to how it could be done better. So to your point, when you said you asked paralegals about, you know, how, how, how do they think they can do things better, how can things be done more efficiently, that's, that's, that's exactly the conversation I think that, that needs to happen. You know, the lawyers out there doing the role, you know, how, 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 could, how, could, how could we do things better for you, how could we kind of free up some of your time? Those kind of conversations are really important. I think um, also, like, it depends on who you're asking for the for the budget for the headcount, right? Because um, I can only speak from our experience working with tech companies, but when they eventually decide to hire a lawyer, I mean, most of them didn't want to hire a lawyer. They were just forced to. They got to a point where they realized they were accruing a lot of risk, so they bit the bullet and bought, and, and bought in a lawyer. Um, and if that lawyer then turns around and says, I need to hire someone else, it's not even a lawyer, then that might be quite a hard conversation. So I suppose it depends on the, the outcomes that you're trying to get from that person rather than what you specifically call the role, because, mm -hmm. like, who cares? Brilliant. And to finish off, our final question, um, what does it look like to hire a legal operations person? What char characteristics do you need? Oh, I don't think about people I've met that do three legal ops or lawyers that we've, we've asked to do them. I think you've got to be really practical and, and be really willing, um, have a bit of a sense of humour about the situation because often you're going into an environment where people aren't used to being asked the kind of questions you're going to ask. So you have to go in there with a fairly down to earth attitude be really practical and think and think quickly about the wind you can show because if it's an unfamiliar role within a, a within a department that may not be that well established in the business, you need to show some some quick wins. I think so. You need to be pretty on the ball. Yeah, I think yeah, you need to be flexible and adaptable as well. Because mm -hmm. I think the role would change over time. You might go in and you might sort of use key things out to start with, and then the role might evolve into something else. Um, so I think being flexible, being adaptable be able to look to the future and plan for the future as well because I think some of these some of these um, changes that you make you might you know they're not going to be instantaneous they're going to be done over the course of a year maybe two years depending on what they are um, so someone that can kind of not just fix today's problems but also look to where the business is going in the future and then how, how to kind of what that business might look like in the future and kind of suggest some changes around that I think is important so kind of a, a more strategic mindset. I think you've got to be quite familiar with data and quite comfortable, yeah. quite comfortable in the depths of Excel. You know, you're in, you're in column Z and row 117 and you're not beginning to feel nauseous at that kind of person. <laughs> <laughs> because I don't think we, maybe I'm speaking unfairly of lawyers, but it's just not core to legal training yeah. to get into Excel and be familiar with, you know, some of the core formulas and pivot tables, etc. But I think while it's not the be-all and end-all, you're going to come across some data, whether it's fee information from your external providers or data on your own team. Um, and if you're not comfortable, if you haven't got someone on board who brings that skill set, I think it would be a bit of a challenge. Great. Yeah, so we can yeah. speak clients. I think um, the book that we mentioned before, a lot of the legal operations, um, kind of dedicated legal operations people who wrote for that book started out in finance. Um, and it's a good way to get a senior role in um, a company. Like, you're not going to get to a head of legal ops role in a kind of Fortune 500 company unless you can talk to the CFO properly. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably partly why they created the role. Um, so I think that financial understanding is probably important. Mm -hmm. and, and do you think it needs to be someone full time or could you have someone coming in on a kind of flexible basis or part time coming in and trying to improve your legal operations? Going off piece here, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I would definitely say yes because that's what I really does. <laughs> <laughs> I think it, it, depends. it, it, it kind of depends on, um, on what's needed. And you might say, okay, look, start with a month of deep dive, five days a week, getting out of the week, and then maybe once you've identified your projects, you, you can maybe think about spending a bit less, frankly, and getting someone to do a bit more remote or a bit more, a few, a few days a week. Mm. I think you could, you could structure it that way. And actually, some, you know, some legal ops is just getting your house in order, isn't it? So finding where all your contracts are now. Mm. You don't need don't really need to be a qualified person to do that. You could get someone in just to find all the documents and put it in a nice order. So it definitely will probably depend on which task of the legal ops you're trying to tackle. 
I think we see that a lot of regulatory projects like the dreaded GDPR stuff. Yeah. Actually, before you even get into the legal aspect, where the heck is everything? What data do we have? What the FBAR is doing? And that is that's like the hygiene factor before you can even get into the analysis. So I think having that that mindset of sort of like what we talked about earlier, dividing up the tasks and trying to disaggregate to yourself, uh, mm-hmm. some of the activities and even and way more junior resources aspect of it. Mm-hmm. Hmm. Okay, well, I think we're just about out of time. So um, thanks everyone for listening, sticking with us. And um, thanks very much for the questions that came in. Um, thanks very much to the panel. Thanks to Fleur, Mary, and Stephanie. Um, and we'll send out a link to the recording later. Don't forget to download the ebook. And you can follow us on Twitter or LinkedIn or on our blog um, to stay up to date for the next webinar.